thank you, uh, Professor Mooney. Uh, my thanks uh, and those of my wife, uh, Sandra, to uh, Dr. Gupta uh, and uh, Mr. Vishal Chandra for the invitation extended. Uh, I'm um, particularly happy because I see uh, on the panel and in the audience uh, several old friends, uh, Professor Muni himself, uh, Professor Partha Ghosh, Ambassador Batarai, General Dipanka Banerjee, uh, all of whom have uh, known me and I have been privileged to know them uh, in my uh, various incarnations going back to the 1980s, I think in the case certainly of Professor Muni. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, I would wish to stress at the outset the particular perspective or vantage point, the point of view from which uh, Sri Lanka views India. This is a view from the south. It is a southern or southernist perspective. Now, those of us uh, who are familiar with international politics and all of us in the room are, are very familiar uh, with the with the fact, I might say, that a perspective from the South in uh, global affairs is quite distinctive. Uh, we are well aware of the third worldist perspective, later known as the perspective from the global South of uh, global dynamics. And when we recall that, we understand that a southern perspective is, is quite specific in, in terms of uh, the narrative, the causal relationship. Things look differently when viewed from the south. Whether it is the tricontinental world looking at the global north or whether it is uh, a neighbor looking up at uh, a great uh, landmass. So, the southern vantage point is something that I want to draw your attention to. It is uh, quite legitimate in uh, uh, the study of uh, politics, as we know. Uh, Antonio Gramsci, the great uh, Italian political thinker, uh, often referred to the southern question within Italy itself. Uh, so, the southern perspective is something that I should underscore. The second is that it is a perspective from the periphery of India. Now, uh, one may think that these two are coterminous, but of course they're not, because India has a periphery uh, that is not to its south. But uh, for Sri Lanka, uh, Sri Lanka exists at the southern periphery of India, and its relationship with India is going by Sri Lankan perceptions, mediated by the complex relationship between itself, Sri Lanka, and India's own inner periphery, that of Tamil Nadu. So, it's, it's a, a story of uh, two, uh, perhaps even three, intersecting peripheries. Tamil Nadu being the uh, inner periphery of the Indian state, uh, the north of Sri Lanka, having co-ethnics uh, from, uh, uh, from Tamil Nadu or of Tamil Nadu, being the northern periphery of the island of Sri Lanka. And the relationship between Sri Lanka and India being perceived as filtered through and mediated by the relationship between these two peripheries. So, you have Sri Lanka on the periphery of India, but the north of Sri Lanka being Sri Lanka's northern periphery, Tamil Nadu being the inner periphery, the southern periphery of India, Sri Lanka being on its outer periphery, and the point of contact, the interface, being Tamil Nadu and Sri Lanka's north. Now, it may be argued that uh, this, is, uh, this is a distortion, an exaggeration, but I uh, once again, uh, I, I wish to remind uh, ourselves that we are talking about the view from the south, the way things look 
from the south and from uh, a complex concatenation of peripheries uh, internal and external. Now, uh, of course, uh, we speak at a particular conjunction uh, where the daily newspapers, uh, both in, in Delhi and Colombo, are uh, speculating, commenting on uh, whether or not the Prime Minister of India should and would uh, attend Chogam in Colombo. Uh, we cannot avoid uh, this uh, particular moment, uh, this particular issue, I shall not, I shall not dwell on it, uh, but I must say that it is a, a very important symptom of the complexities of uh, the relationship between Sri Lanka and India and Sri Lanka's perception of India. Now, uh, given the material available in the public domain, and uh, I'm one of those who does believe that 80% uh, uh, if not more of uh, uh, serious uh, information is already available in the public domain. Uh, certainly this time around, the Tamil Nadu factor seems to be uh, more preponderant than ever in uh, acting either as a pressure group or as a parameter of India's relationship with Sri Lanka. Now, this is fascinating because in the case of the Indo-Sri Lanka relationship, we know that uh, uh, Indian perceptions of uh, uh, headway made by its uh, uh, fellow Asian power, China, uh, and also by its uh, long-standing uh, other in the region, Pakistan, uh, color India's uh, perception and policies towards Sri Lanka. But even when the interests are so manifest and the strategic factors so clear, the role of a sub-state unit, such as Tamil Nadu, has acquired an intrusive salience. Now, what does this mean? Uh, I cannot help uh, adopt a, a perspective from my own training that of political science and ask the question, whether or not India is making a transition from a federation or quasi-federal system as it used to be known to a confederation. Now, the move from a, a federation to a confederation is not signaled by uh, the stridency of Tamil Nadu's position on Sri Lanka, because we have at least one other very well-known and exceedingly federal state in which you have a similar situation, and that is uh, the, the policy of uh, the United States towards Cuba uh, being uh, heavily uh, influenced, uh, if not uh, shaped, by the views in Florida, in the state of Florida. So that is clearly a, a federal system, and you have uh, this not very happy situation of uh, a very strident, almost fanatical view in Florida, which is now beginning to be modulated because a new generation has moved up in, uh, in the demographics of Florida, but uh, where the capital uh, feels somehow constrained by the electoral dynamics and public perception in Florida. So it is not only the stridency of Tamil Nadu's views that make me raise the question of whether there is a shift to a, uh, a confederation, de facto. Perhaps an asymmetric confederation with uh, uh, the southern periphery, India's uh, inner uh, periphery playing a, a special role that other states do not play. Now, the reason I say this 
is because of a little noticed um, set of incidents. The so-called transnational government of Tamililand, the TGTE, which is located in the United States of America, has, through lawyers, filed a case in the Tamil Nadu courts against the Ministry of External Affairs of India. Now, it seems uh, that the TGTE filed a petition, sent a petition to the Ministry of External Affairs about the participation of Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and whether or not India should boycott Chogun uh, entirely. Uh, the Ministry of External Affairs of India, uh, I believe, didn't give it uh, uh, any particular priority. And a case was filed in the highest courts of Tamil Nadu against the Ministry of External Affairs of India on behalf of the original petitioners, the TGT. Now that is something that does not happen in a federal state. The implications are very clear. This is uh, a non-state entity that uh, is not recognized by any other state. The so-called transnational government of Tamil Elam, um, set up with the explicit purpose, explicit in its title, of the carving out of a separate state uh, of the northern east of Sri Lanka, which sends a petition to the Ministry of External Affairs of India, um, which cans it, more or less, and then files a case in Tamil Nadu, which is heard. Perhaps not by very sympathetic judges, but it is heard, it is entertained. I leave it to you, ladies and gentlemen, to work out the implications. But it should be fairly obvious as to how it would be perceived by Sri Lankans, the majority of whom uh, happen to be Sinhalese, but that again uh, at the moment is of little salience because it sends a signal to the Tamil people as well. Now, um, it, it has been argued both in Delhi but also in Colombo that um, Tamil Nadu uh, is, is uh, overrated as a factor in India's policy making towards Sri Lanka. There are those in Colombo, uh, largely uh, of hawkish persuasion, who say, look, this is entirely the center. They're just using Tamil Nadu. Can't you see what the game is? Uh, and there are those in Delhi who would say, look, I mean, come on, it's not Tamil Nadu. Uh, don't overestimate uh, the role played by Tamil Nadu. This is to do with India's interests. Now, I'm not convinced, I'm afraid. I'm not convinced because there is a continuity going back at least to the late 1980s, of um, the Tamil Nadu variable playing a special role of a sort that you rarely, if at all, see played by a sub-state unit in any, uh, any state system. If, if one goes back to the... Uh, the landmark speech made by uh, the late uh, Sri Mani Dixit at the uh, United Services Institute down the road uh, after the accord and, and uh, its uh, the partial the failure partially of the peacekeeping operation uh, Sri Mani Dixit uh, made uh, three points and the last one had to do with uh, the role of Tamil Nadu uh, he referred to the early secessionism in post independence India uh, emanating from Tamil Nadu and the need for Delhi to be seen, to be sensitive to the sensibilities of Tamil Nadu. So this was one of the three factors that uh, Sri Mani Dixit uh, mentioned. But uh, those of us uh, uh, who were uh, peripheral participant observers such as I was during what we may call the Madras Cafe years of the uh, Indo Lanka Accord, uh, I, I was uh, a minister in that uh, first provincial council 25 years ago, uh, remember that there were many things that the Indian Armed Forces, uh, having been brutally set upon by the Tigers, were unable to do, even in their own defense, because of the confusion, the, the buffer factor of Tamil Nadu. 
uh, those of you with a military background would remember, whether it was the use of tactical air power, uh, whether it was cooperation with the Sri Lankan military, uh, all of which would have helped anchor the Indo Lanka Accord and the 13th Amendment in the Provincial Council. Uh, these could not be done precisely because of the role played uh, by Chief Minister M.G. Ramachandran at that time uh, and uh, the Tamil Nadu factor. Now, we moved from the late 1980s through to the year 2000, where uh, President uh, Chandrika Banadanka Kumaratunga, who was uh, very well disposed towards Sri Lanka, uh, and the foreign ministry, uh, foreign policy under uh, the late, well, uh, at the time, Honorable Lakshman Kadurgama, was one of uh, dynamic equidistance between uh, Delhi and Beijing, um, and had not reached the point of the tilt that we now see on the part of Colombo uh, towards Beijing. Uh, when the state of Sri Lanka faced uh, a very serious threat with the fall of uh, the army base or uh, retrenchment uh, from Elephant Pass. Uh, and uh, the Sri Lankan government sought assistance from uh, the government of India, which was uh, a BJP government at that time, uh, Sri Vajpayee's government. Uh, it was turned down. We were helpfully nudged in another direction, uh, that of Israel. But the only support that uh, India was willing to give was to evacuate our troops. And as uh, Prime Minister, as the President, Chandrika uh, Bandarani Kumar told Nirupama Subramaniam of the Hindu, and it was on the record, uh, she was very disappointed. And this was a government that was committed to the devolution of power, unlike the present administration in Colombo. But even so, even so, India felt constrained in supporting the government of Sri Lanka in a situation of serious uh, 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 serious military threat. It happened again at the commencement of the war in 2006, late 2005, when India had the option of uh, giving uh, the Sri Lankan state adequate support. Uh, it did give very valuable support, but uh, adequate support which would have been linked to political progress. But whether it was the question of the three-dimensional radar or certain other inputs, India felt that it could not go beyond a certain point. And that point seems to be uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, set or, or, or drawn by the Tamil Nadu factor. Now, uh, I would uh, bring my presentation to a close by some observations about the current situation and the interests of both our states. Sri Lanka has uh, held the elections to the Northern Provincial Council, belatedly, um, and uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to be the only one uh, in the room at the swearing-in of Chief Minister Vigneshwaran, who had also been in the room when Chief Minister Perumal was sworn in by President uh, J.R. Javadana 25 years ago. Now, this would be entirely the wrong time. Uh, for India to send a signal uh, by downgrading the level of participation at Chobe. Um, because it is, in a way, a victory of Indian diplomacy that the elections were held. And India needs to be engaged in order to nudge the actual devolution of power along. While uh, unfurling uh, an umbrella of sorts over the fledgling Northern Provincial Council. Uh, the absence of the Prime Minister of India, for whatever reason, would be seen, given the Indian press itself, as uh, reflecting uh, uh, a determining role played by Tamil Nadu. And the strategic implications cannot but be drawn by the Colombo establishment, uh, including the security arm. Um, this would cause a shift vertically and horizontally, vertically from the uh, uh, flexible, pragmatic centrism of uh, President Rajapaksa to uh, perhaps more dogmatic uh, members of uh, the, the power structure and the ruling coalition, including uh, his own family. And vertically, uh, to those um, combat-hardened younger officers, uh, who feel that there is uh, a long-term, if not permanent, threat 
emanating from uh, Sri Lanka's north, uh, not just the northern province, but uh, further north than that, the far north, Tamil Nadu, and beyond that, uh, the Delhi itself is now captured in terms of its Sri Lanka policy by Tamil Nadu and will remain that way. Um, I end with an anecdote. In 2009, uh, December, I believe, November, uh, President Rajapaksa invited me along uh, for the first state visit uh, by a Sri Lankan head of state to Vietnam. And uh, I was happy to go along. And there we were at a banquet uh, in Ho Chi Minh City uh, where we were able to see the, the famous gates which the uh, North Vietnamese tank broke through uh, on April 30th, 1975. I had watched it as a boy on television in Europe. Uh, and next to me was a brilliant young uh, foreign ministry official from uh, Hanoi. Uh, he had just come back from the Fletcher School. He was also a member of the Communist Party, and he was uh, sitting for one of the higher exams uh, to move up uh, in the party. And I found uh, an extremely ironic situation. Uh, President Rajapaksa half joking said, I've told him you, you, uh, you know a lot about uh, the history of the Vietnamese Revolution and the Vietnamese Communist Party, which is perhaps uh, not entirely untrue. But what was ironic was that I was having to defend the role of Ho Chi Minh, General Jap, Le Zuan, Xuan Xin, with this young, very bright young officer. And what he told me was, Sir, our leaders should have known that uh, Vietnam's permanent enemy, permanent adversary, would be the giant to our north, China. What were they doing fighting the Americans? Now, that is not a perception that I would encourage India to foster <coughs> in the Sri Lankan state apparatus and its armed forces, and not a perception that I would uh, be happy to see shared by uh, the majority of Sri Lankans, 75 percent of whom who are Sinhalese. It is true. It is just a perception, but uh, as Friedrich Nietzsche reminded us, there are no facts, only interpretations. Thank you.